the infatuation with renewables has to be judged by when can they become big enough to be relevant. That is not in this decade. What it means for energy supply, security, and investments is the topic on Consuelo Mack Wealth Track. Funding provided by ClearBridge Investments, Morgan Le Fay Dreams Foundation, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and Women Investing in Security and Education. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. If you were to ask investors to name the biggest headwinds facing the markets, higher inflation and interest rates and their potentially negative impact on corporate earnings would top the list. Just about everyone on Wall Street agrees we are in a new era of higher levels of both. But this week's guest believes there is another area which poses even greater challenges to the global economy and markets, energy. Energy is under enormous pressure on numerous fronts, geopolitical, production, distribution, and financing. It's a combination creating a new era of energy insecurity. Our guest is Tom Petrie, a longtime industry thought leader in the oil and gas industry. Since 2012, he has been chairman of Petrie Partners, an influential investment banking and consulting boutique to the industry. In his long career as investment banker, top-ranked oil analyst and consultant to the industry and governments, Petrie has been an active advisor on more than $250 billion of energy-related mergers and acquisitions, including many of the largest in the business. He is the author of Following Oil, Four Decades of Cycle Testing Experiences and What They Foretell About U.S. Energy Independence. Well, what is happening with U.S. energy independence? Petrie provided us with this chart showing how after decades of declining, U.S. oil production picked up significantly in the last decade and a half, largely thanks to the shale oil revolution, to the point where it surpassed Russia and Saudi Arabia's output to become the world's largest oil producer. Despite that achievement, Petrie says the U.S. and the rest of the world are approaching a possible energy crisis caused by a number of factors. And one of the biggest, some new geopolitical realities, what he calls geopolitical fragility. I asked him to explain. Well, this is an idea that came out of my writing the book Following Oil back in 2014. And I became aware that one of the big consequences of 9-11 was a big changing alignment of power axes in the Eastern Hemisphere. Moscow and Beijing became much more closely aligned in some of their objectives for their countries. Um, the, the third party in a triangle of power there was Tehran, which having uh, really already been alienated by the West uh, ever since uh, 1980 and the, the hostage crisis and the Iranian revolution, there was a new power triangle developing where those three countries had reasons to want to uh, thwart some of what they saw as undesirable actions uh, by the enemy of their enemy. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend is an old adage, mm -hmm. and it really applies here where each of those countries had reasons to be at odds with the U.S. on various situations, some more so than others. But they began to realize if they could align in a power triangle, they could perhaps be more effective in thwarting the U.S. as it looked to assert uh, its power uh, as a global uh, leader. What is now fragile? The fragility in part came out of the Arab Spring. And the Arab Spring was in 2011. Uh, the popular uh, press coverage of it was that this was a, a, a democratic uprising against uh, dictatorial or at least autocratic leaders uh, in, in much of the Arab world. So uh, the fragility developed because more and more there was tension between uh, important geopolitical powers uh, in the Eastern Hemisphere vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the de facto U.S. leadership that had come out of the Arab Gulf War of 1990 mm -hmm. when Saddam went in and took over uh, Kuwait. Uh, Kuwait. Um, and then there was a major military action that uh, 
then was followed also by the uh, the U.S. invasion of uh, of Iraq uh, there a decade later. So those two events really uh, caused the axes of power to become quite solidified. Talk to us about what this realignment means for energy supplies, for oil and gas supplies. Sure. Oil has a lot to do with why these realignments are so significant. It, it does. And, and uh, a good example is uh, the, the, what we call the, the shale revolution. The U.S. went from a level of production that had dropped all the way down from just under 10 million barrels a day 40 years ago, was dropped down to less than 6 million barrels a day over the subsequent three or four decades. And then with the shale revolution, uh, a whole new ability to develop U.S. production occurred. And that 6 million barrels a day in less than a decade rose up to 13.3 million barrels a day. That became a real challenge for both Saudi Arabia and Russia. It became a real clear to uh, Russia that they were going to be losing some market share. Ch uh, Saudi Arabia, a traditional ally of the U.S., um, you know, my, my firm, Petrie Parkman & Company, was an advisor to the Saudis on their gas initiative uh, early in uh, 2000, uh, the year 2000, 2001, 2, and 3. Um, and, and so at that time, the Saudis were very appreciative that the problem of, of Iraq controlling Kuwait had been solved. Uh, but in subsequent times, as we became a greater producer, our need for Saudi oil dropped significantly. Uh -huh. China's growth was, was the offset. And so the Saudi interest in, uh, in having a good relationship and a and an effective trade relationship with uh, uh, with China uh, was on the rise. Almost every barrel of reduced U.S. consumption of uh, Saudi oil uh, was offset by uh, by China taking on those barrels, and so that's that's part of the realignment again that's going on. I mentioned in my introduction to you that you know the U.S. became the world's number one um, oil producer uh, in 2019-2020, and there was a lot of talk about you know the U.S. is now energy independent, and are we energy independent? I mean, what what happened to that goal? We're close to energy independent. The advent of COVID uh, was such that that. That caused some disruptions, and as a result of that, we lost 2 million barrels a day. At the peak level, we were at 13.3 million barrels a day. We dropped all the way down to 11.3 million barrels a day. That took us essentially out of being fully independent, but, but still it's within reach. We've right. since recovered uh, about a million barrels a day of that, but we're somewhere between uh, 1.1 and 1.2 million barrels a day below the peak level that we had. And right. We, it so was demand an fell cycle. off and basically they, they cut production because right. there was no demand in the market. That's right. But then, then the next thing that happened is we elected uh, President Biden. Right. And, and his policies in general are, are not directed at recovering production. full energy independence. Uh -huh. uh, he, he, and th that's because of the dynamic tension that exists between prioritization of climate change initiatives and uh, and development of, of uh, domestic oil supplies. This is the push-pull that we've seen now for a couple of decades between the the climate change goals and the the need to keep the lights on, essentially that's through. Right. Fossil That's very fuels, well put. traditional fossil fuels, yeah. and, and as we make this transition, and it's the transition is going to take a lot longer than a lot of people would like, but in 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 the meantime, you know, energy independence, given what we've just been talking about, of all of the the problems with oil producers and other parts of the world, um, energy independence is uh, it strikes me as a very worthwhile goal, and I mean, how close 
are we? We were virtually there on energy independence. It went, there would be times during the year when we'd be a little bit less and so on, but we were a big enough producer that the ability of OPEC to be a sole price determinant of uh, the price of oil was much diminished. That's the best way to think of it when uh -huh. people say, well, we what what level of energy independence did we have? And it was but it was a combination of both oil and natural gas, because natural gas is also very important in the equation. We had enough natural gas that in fact one of the big goals of uh, the people who are concerned about climate change is to reduce dependence on coal production. Right. Burn, burning coal, the chemistry of burning coal puts more carbon in the air for per unit of energy that can be consumed than any other fossil fuel. And, and the U.S. became much cleaner, much more uh, decisive, if you will, in embracing uh, uh, the, the benefits of that. But there is a, there's a serious uh, dichotomy here right. where uh, the timing of, of events uh, and the, the timing of geopolitical pressures uh, are not uh, synchronized in a way that is optimal for us. And we need to, we really do need to recognize that. We've got a situation today where, again, going back to the power triangle, um, uh, China, China has a, a an energy crisis. And, and they certainly are energy short. Some of that they can meet with more imports of Saudi oil and other oil from OPEC. Um, but it's still going to be increased use of fossil fuels in, in today's world are still building coal fired plants. And they're making the case in the in the forums where climate change issues are debated that they can't afford at this point not to do that. Mm -hmm. Their promises as to what they'll do uh, in the in the current decade and the next two decades after that are fairly soft. And, and that's, a, that's a source of, of issue and sure. debate between uh, the leaders of China, the, the leader of China, and, uh, and much of Europe and much of uh, North America. Tom, one of the legacies that you described from the, uh, the failed Arab Spring in 2011 uh, was the fact that it created uh, some failed states and uh, Libya and Syria and uh, Yemen. Why are they important? Why, why do they matter? Well, they're all sources of uh, uh, instability in the Middle East. And, and they, at any time, they can erupt into something that's more, more difficult. You know, it's true of all wars, I'd say, that they're a lot easier to start than they are to finish. Mm -hmm. So in the case of Yemen, what we had was the Saudis wanting to counter moves that had already been made by Iran uh, in Yemen. And so when that, when that started some half decade ago, um, we had a situation where it, 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 was a, it was a real shooting war. It's turned into now one of the largest humani uh, humanitarian crises going because of the damages that were done. And those, those, when you have that humanitarian crisis, it just festers. And so it's a source of instability. It's also, it also complicates the, the uh, uh, Cold War status that exists between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a Sunni Muslim uh, power and Iran is a Shia. And so they're, they're in constantly in a state of war. There's profound lack of trust but it was less than three years ago that Iran sent missiles into Saudi Arabia to disrupt their ability to export oil and gas. Right, which sent oil but, prices right but That's higher. right, and right. That, it answers that question. Mm -hmm. It turned out that the Saudis, having uh, become more aligned with Iraq, were able to finesse that. So the disruption that Iran tried to create there was not as big as we feared it would be, but the conditions where something similar could happen and be more detrimental 
are still in place. We have some real challenges uh, as far as uh, oil and gas security, energy security. And sure. how big a wake-up call was Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the energy disruptions that that is causing? It was a very big one, no question about it. What's your outlook for oil and gas prices? Are, are we going to be living with higher oil and gas prices for a while? Well, yes, we are, but, but, but that doesn't mean ever higher no matter what. I think oil could trade in the next uh, 12 to 24 months as low as back to um, something in the $80 a barrel range. And, and if it goes higher than the current levels, call it 106 to 110, I think that will trigger corrective action that will take it lower. We have options to, to go to other, to alternative, to other energy sources, right? And so that the demand will fall once it reaches certain high levels. The infatuation with renewables is, has to be judged by when can they become big enough to be relevant. Right. That is not in this decade, in my opinion. Uh, you know, the goal of some policymakers would be, let's get going on this and so it's, it happens by 2025. It, we will be lucky if it's happening in the very late in this decade and gets big enough in the first half of the next decade. But what's going to happen is there's enough economic disruption in the offing with this that the fear of a recession and, and a global recession um, is such that that's where the correction in, in oil prices is likely to occur. I think that's more likely than a sustainably high price at this level or anything higher. It can happen, but anything higher than what we have today, I think is likely to trigger economic disruptions oh. that cause the downside tests to be um, as brutal as they've been several other times in recent decades. For the first time in well over a decade, energy, which has been a laggard, uh, energy stocks are now leaders. How long do you think that's going to continue? Is, is this going well, to be a, a long cycle of, of energy stock leadership? And I'm specifically talking about, you know, fossil fuels, oil and gas companies. Two years ago, oil and gas companies were the worst performers. This last 12 months, they've started, uh, they've started to be the best performers. Right. That's reaching its limit. And, and if it plays out with the price corrections I've just suggested, they, they could be market performers uh, but but they're not likely to be outperformers. Um, there's a there's a big challenge still here, but we need to be realistic and understanding that between now and 2035 to 2040, there's still a big role that we we're, we're going to be dependent on fossil fuel activity. The key is let's go for the for the lowest adverse impact on on uh, emissions, and that's natural gas. The next lowest is high quality U.S. produced oil. And, and let's, let's try to get to a position where China's willing to embrace um, uh, some kind of a strategy that doesn't involve building so many new coal-fired plants that they fully offset whatever benefits we're generating with, with cleaner fossil fuels while we're looking to embrace uh, the the renewables that do have a role to play in the world we're heading toward. And because oil and gas prices are so high, obviously energy companies, producers uh, are making a lot of money. And uh, when I'm looking at the majors like uh, you know Chevron and ExxonMobil and Total, in, instead of investing in production, uh, they're increasing their stock buybacks, uh, paying dividends. Is that going to continue? Uh, I think in the majors and in, in the well-capitalized independents, there is a real interest in, in developing more supply. They, we came back by a million six. It wasn't just turning the taps. Um, uh, by, we came back, back by a million, a uh, uh, little over a million barrels a day already. 
And some of that was new development. Rig, rig activity is stepping up and so on. The, but what we're going to have, I think, is also there are cases where uh, companies in this industry are looking for what renewables make sense in their operations. Now, will it move the needle overall? Uh, that's hard to determine at this point. But that excess cash flow that you're referring to today, to the degree it stays in place, and, and frankly, uh, I think it's likely to shrink some uh, but because of the volatility and the, and the downward bias that I think we're going to see in, in prices um, triggered by how high they are right now uh, and by whatever happens to economic activity. Uh, I think we will see uh, people in this industry look for worthwhile renewable investments as part of their overall uh, investment portfolio. Tom, one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio, what should we all own some of in a long-term diversified portfolio? Well, one of the big things right now that makes sense geopolitically and economically is development of uh, LNG. and uh, Liquefied natural gas. That's right. And Germany's come around to that. Uh, you know, the, the, the wake up call that occurred for Germany and others who were dependent in Europe on, on natural gas uh, is to make greater utilization of LNG coming in from the Western Hemisphere, not just the U.S. So in order to invest in that, so look for companies that are producing? Chenier Energy is a good example of that and, uh, and others, and others that will be developing. And also some of the majors are going to be, you know, when you talk about that, that cash flow um, uh, that's developing, uh, Exxon, Chevron, and others are all uh, putting some of that ca big cash flow change back into developing more LNG. So there are public companies that where that's going to be uh, on the margin, uh, one of their big new investments. The other big thing that's going to occur, and, and Exxon's leading on this, is carbon sequestration, where you take carbon uh, out of the air where it's being emitted and, and put it back in the ground. And there's logic to that as well. And the majors have the ability, the technical skill sets, and the ability to do that. There's a wide variety of actions that they're being examined now and where there's action occurring to do that and the and the ESG requirements for public companies reporting, they need to be showing where they're actually uh, looking to address some of these challenges. And uh, you know the, the ESG reports that are coming out the last two years are showing increased focus on those kind of initiatives. Uh, it, it's energy is going to really matter uh, to uh, all the uh, the, the countries of this world. And uh, if, if we don't address it effectively, energy poverty for the lesser developed countries is going to be a high priority if we're going to have a stable world order. Tom Petrie, the energy industry is fascinating. You have been following oil, as you wrote about in your book, for more than four decades. So thanks so much for sharing your insights with us. Thanks a lot, Consuelo. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is make sure you have some hedges against disaster. We have been longtime advocates of holding a stash of cash for emergencies for periods of geopolitical unrest. Russia's war against Ukraine is certainly a case in point, and also episodes of market volatility. With interest rates rising, cash is becoming more valuable. Yields on three-month treasuries are increasing and can be rolled over at higher yields when they mature. The other hedge is gold, a universally acknowledged store of value in times of trouble. Gold ETFs are the simplest and most liquid vehicles to use. In the past, we have suggested two stalwarts, Spider Gold Shares ETF, symbol GLD, the oldest and largest physically-backed gold ETF in the world. Launched in 2004, it has nearly $70 billion in assets and has an expense ratio of four-tenths of a percent, or $40 for an investment of $10,000.
The next largest and slightly cheaper choice is the iShares Gold Trust, symbol IAU. Launched in 2005, it has over $30 billion in assets and has an expense ratio of a quarter of a percent, so you can save a few dollars there. There are also lots of newer gold ETFs, but if you're going to buy an insurance policy against disaster, which is basically what gold is, you might as well go with the financially strongest issuers. State Street and BlackRock certainly qualify. Next week, Harbor Capital Advisors Christoph Gleisch explains his process of selecting best-in-class money managers and also creating unusual actively managed ETFs. In this week's extra feature, Petrie shares his views on why the U.S. needs a new energy strategy. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.